Hello, friends. Give me just a minute, I'll be with you. I'm using a paint stirrer as, as a uh, palette knife at the moment. Getting a uh, little highlight, white highlights on this cheap, or whatever it's called. The, the antenna there. All right. Finally, finally, finally. I've been threatening to do this for weeks <laughs> or promising to do this as the case may be. And I'm finally getting around to it. Yahoo. So my name is Dan. This is Dan's Art Adventure number 24, I think. And this is uh, the big. I've been averaging 20 or 25 hours a week for six months, just over six months on this project. So 750 hours, I don't know, whatever that is. And my assistant, Luke, my uh, apprentice, Luke, has spent even more, considerably more time than I have. So this, I'm just starting here because this is where we're gonna end up. I'm gonna give you a whirlwind tour of the rest of the work and then come back and paint in here. This is the Serengeti room. <clears throat> this whole, hello uncle. And uh, this is Mount Kilimanjaro. These are acacia trees. I had to look it up. What kind of trees are those? And I was just painting a minute ago on a little Land Rover, right, safari. The fun part of this room is going to be to come back and add Monkeys and cheetahs hanging in the trees and lions and zebras and no bears, elephants and antelope, whatever. This job, okay, so let me back up and say this is a, I'm in a church in Wake Forest, North Carolina, about 15 miles, 15 minutes from my house. And uh, a lot of old friends here and they hired me and my assistant Luke to paint and do more than paint, as you will see, three, a lot of 3D uh, fabrication of uh, a long hallway that I'll show you in a minute that's done, 99.9% .9 finished, long hallway, which is the biggest part of the job, and then six separate areas, of which two are partly done, four we haven't even touched yet. But uh, let me see, well, I'll give you a quick I'll give, I'll give you a quick glance around this room since we're here. So this is uh, a Sunday school room for, um, I think it's two to four year olds. And you might, <laughs> you might wonder why, why they pick, well, I don't really know why they picked the Serengeti myself, but that's all right, I, I like it. I, even more than that, I like that they chose to go with representational or realistic artwork. Um, and this area here is, is going to be a tent. We're going to paint part of it, but then most of it is going to be actual canvas painted to, to match, and then an opening and so on and so forth. So all this area over here, everything that we painted beige is going to be tent. So it's like safari tent. I, the main thing <coughs> for two to four year olds is, I'll let you turn around and see something a little more pretty while I'm talking, <clears throat> is the animals. So the, the four year old, two, two to four year olds will love the zebras, lions, elephants, giraffes, antelope, wildebeest maybe, monkeys, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so there will be a whole menagerie of animals and that'll be fun. All right, so I'm gonna come back here in a while Let's go out. Everything right at the moment is running on batteries. So um, as long as our batteries don't run out, we'll be okay. All right, now that right in front of you is unfinished element. That's going to be lava flowing light. And I think these lights, will, I'm not sure if these lights, okay. <laughs> right now it's a blue light. We don't want blue light, we want, it's LED. So it'll be, it'll be red light behind the lava. And uh, that's unfinished, as you can see. Uh, but this is a cave. This is a hallway. And it's a lot of big gray rocks with, ooh, 
veins of gold and other gem-like and jewel-like surprises happening. Little, little, uh, I don't know, greenish sparkly stuff there. Anyway, so that's our hallway, but that's just on the way to the big, the big job. So here is the front hallway. I think it's 140 feet long, more or less. And I'm gonna to try to do this without making you guys dizzy. Let's go out here to the entrance. So it's fair to say we spent six months, me and Luke. Luke and I spent six months on nothing but this hallway. And this is the entrance. I'll back up even a little bit more so you can see the full impact of this tree that we built. Uh, most of the 3D stuff, I mean, look at this up close, moss, lines, rough bark, and it's, most of the stuff that we built is styrofoam coated with either concrete or a sort of a high-tech kind of concrete called foam coat. So anyway, that's the entryway. Cool, huh? Then, now let me see. I'm, I, I'm afraid I really am going to make you dizzy if I try to show you both. Oh, well, anyway, let's just go. So we come in here to this part, and these are obviously some kind of ruins, <laughs> temple ruins. I'm not sure what the theological implication of that is. <laughs> but as it, if, if it looks like I, we, I, we had fun, doggone it. <laughs> you can't imagine how much fun. I mean, working hard, okay? Working really hard, but um, this, honestly, doing 3D, 3D fabrication, which I've done, you know, a fair bit of over the years for set design, TV th studios, and theatrical productions, set design. Um, I've done a fair amount of that. And, but this is by far the biggest job I've ever done. And as you will see, we have just had buckets of fun. Let me look at your chats here for a minute. It is a combination of latex paint and acrylic. Latex, acrylic, and sometimes stuff added to that, like glue, uh, acrylic medium, flow trawl, which is kind of like uh, construction quality uh, acrylic. Uh, it, we found out flow trawl is cheaper than acrylic medium, so we ended up using more of that. Let me, since I'm here, I'll go ahead and show you the back side of this tree. Um, let me see what other chats you guys. Hello, Redina. <laughs> and hello, Nancy. Yes, we do have to seal it. Uncle asked, do we have to seal it? Yes, and that's the one thing that has not been done. Um, anyway, cool, huh? So these, these trees, by the way, first of all, once you slap them one time, <laughs> you don't really feel like doing it a lot <laughs> because it's concrete. It's we left it, by the way, on purpose. We left it really rough. Um, for that reason, it, it kind of resists a lot of hands-on because it's just not comfortable. It's really rough and hard. You, you don't want to knock on it, believe me. Uh, but it is climbable. Everything, no, I'm not going to climb on it, but you know, we've, we've made everything, all these branches up here, we're, we are concerned about, not about six-year-old kids, but about you know, the big brothers, 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old kids. You know, saying, hey, I wonder if that branch will hold me, you know, and, and stuff like that. And we've done things to try to diminish some of that. Anyway, we can't keep all that from happening, but we can keep calm. I will say one of my favorite parts is these branches. Um, and, and everything in here, of course, we had, to, we experimented and tried. These, of course, are real branches picked up in the woods, a lot of them behind my house, and spray painted with a couple layers of paint to help preserve them. And then we glued artificial leaves to these. Now over here, I'm sorry, I'm through. These are real leaves, and the jury is still out whether they're going to stay. <laughs> I won't get into that too much. But those are holly leaves, and holly leaves are 
more resilient. Anyway, that's that's all I'm going to say. So, and we did, as you can see, just tons and megatons of painting and painting and painting. And then out here, we added, and we'll come back and add a few more of these three-dimensional ferns. Um, oh, a, a quick description, I guess, is of of these ferns. Uh, I mean, time has always been, we've been in a hurry. We, we work literally at a breakneck speed on this whole project. So I discovered if you take a paint roller, we did a long one, found out the short one was better, and wrap a string around it really tight, leaving a gap between each loop, that we could paint these ferns, you know, and boom, boom, boom. And so we, we learned how to paint ferns en masse fast, just lightning speed. So we painted thousands of ferns. While I'm talking about painting tricks, um, we painted the floor in here too, and we discovered that a corner painter, a piece, a yellow round spongy thing that you buy at a paint store that's for made for painting in cracks, if you put paint on it and just hit it one time, it makes a perfect little leaf shape like that. So there again, we uh, used all kinds of tricks, everything we could think of. Um, the, the trunks, especially in the early stage, the underneath, the underpainting of these trees, the trunks were all done with rollers, a four inch roller. You can see that, right? I tried not to let it show up too much. You know, I didn't want all my trunks to be the same width, but that's pretty much a roller right there. <laughs> Now we come back and just touch up a briefly. This, so this is a roller too, and all the, uh, most of these branches, and, and there's millions of branches, as you can see. So I don't know if this is interesting to you or not, but I'm going to show you anyway. So all these, most of these branches right here, a roller on a corner, right? And up here, um, again, here's some. I think these leaves, I think, were done with brushes. But let me see if I can find some right nearby that were done with that sponge roller I told you about. Oh, yeah, sure. Here's some. Just a minute. So, again, the, we're always looking for shortcuts. Some of these were done with sponge. These were done with the, with the uh, sponge roller. A bunch of those were done. Anyway, so we figured out fat. Now, then, of course, we always had to come back and paint you know, the old-fashioned way with, with brushes. These leaves were done with the sponge roller. So if you get what I mean, just one hit. I'll show you the roller when we go back to the Serengeti room, but just one, and it makes a perfect leaf. And that's what I did all along the floor. So while we're here, though, let me give you the, the long view of the hallway and why we, part of why we painted the floor. Um, the illusion is pretty pretty darn convincing. Um, you, see, you could probably see where the hallway ends, but we painted the path up onto the wall. So it, it's, I was really tickled with the three-dimensional effect that that achieved. All right, so back to stuff at home. Again, here's the, I mean, at home, close by. Here's, here's pillar. Ruins, again, more branches with leaves glued to them and grass growing out of the top and, of course, stains on the, you know, weathered on the, on the pillar, ivy growing on the pillars, everything, everything. And the back in the background is um, the, the, whoops, the stone wall of the ruins. And then up close, of course, are the, some of the bricks up close and nearby. And uh, of course, yes, those are all, I'm not going to stand in them, but yeah, they're, they're standable. Kids will climb on those for sure. And that's okay. I, we, as you can see, I just feel like we pulled out all the stops. You know, there's moss and lichen, and like I say, stains, everything, everything. Moss hanging from up there, roots hanging down, blah, 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 blah. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> I am just going to make you dizzy. So there's, again, part of the pillar falling down. The 
this is concrete with rocks mixed in with it. That's, that, that was important because we discovered if we didn't put this concrete down here, that the cleaning crew would come here near for 20 years, 50 years, with their vacuum cleaner just go wah, boom, right into the base of our, of our stuff. And even though it's coated with concrete, it's pretty hard. It wouldn't survive 10 years or 20 or 50 years of vacuum cleaner. So we had to put a barrier, and that works really well. So that's our transition. Same thing over there at the, at the base of our uh, big tree there. Uh, then here is a bridge with a rope. Uh, kids are going to climb on that rope. So as you can imagine, let me set you down here. It was a, it was a bit of an in engineering trick because kids are going to climb on this. And it's a bit of a trick to get those two posts. Do you hear that? So that they won't collapse. So we have, we have concrete anchor screws going into the floor. I have bolts going into the wall, all hidden, of course. You can't see any of that st stuff. And uh, then the, uh, the overall scene on this side of the bridge, some of my favorite, and where, I, and where I focused much of my attention, of course, is in the painting, especially the distant vistas. So here we have a mountain, beautiful dramatic storm clouds, a distant lake, a distant waterfall, then the water disappears, reappears here. What we're looking at here is a waterfall falling away from us, okay? So it's going under this bridge and falling away from us because here on the other side of the bridge is the waterfall uh, coming down toward us. So once again, I mean, this is up here. Uh, that's just classic Dan Nelson story realist realism painting that that's all that is that just and so is frankly so is waterfall stuff like this is what i used to paint 20 25 years ago just for fun you know and of course the dimensionality of having these leaves this this by the way is one thing that's not i'm going to do a little bit of touch up down there in the water it needs a little more white sparkle that might be the only thing still to be done out here and then as you can see right next to that we come to some of the most fun as far as successful illusion that we've got. Let me back you up a little bit so you can see this. There were so many times that we did things and well, and we'd be doing them, it's like, ah, they didn't turn out very well. And then we'd have to back up and do it again and do it different, do it harder and blah, blah, come up with a different plan. That's what happened with these rocks. We, we painted them one way and it's like, hmm, doesn't work, so we scratched our chins, put on our thinking caps, and uh, painted them again. And I don't know about you, but th this is one of my most proud parts of the whole thing. <laughs> these look, at least in North Carolina, these look so much like real rocks with moss and lichens on them. Um, and it's not until you touch them do you figure out they're not real. And the fun part for me is this back here, of course, those are all painted on the wall rocks. And I just, I just love, let me see how that looks in, yeah, it looks pretty good. You, you can hardly tell, can you? I mean, yeah, I know you can, but you know what I mean? These look so dimensional with these in front of them. I'm just tickled to death with how that turned out. So that's uh, part of the, the, the wall comes up. Oh, let me, let me give you some of the effect here by closing these doors, to, closing the doors to our cave. This also was, and I didn't do most of this. My assistant Luke actually did most of this. I, I helped, but um, we built these great big three-dimensional rocks first, and of course spent a lot of time building the rocks, and then we just painted this stuff and people were so, <laughs> so impressed with the, with the painting that looks so real. Look, I'll, t I'll let you look at that. So that's all just flat painted. And it looks so dimensional. Airbrush, a lot of airbrush on, on all this stuff. Lots of airbrush. And, and Wagner power painter, so, you know, gigantic. And, and this is the first thing we did is paint the wall with paint with concrete in it. So it's, it, this all, it has the same texture as this. It's rough. You don't want to knock on it because it'll scrape skin off your fingers. So that's the, uh, 
that entrance to the cave. Looks like an entrance to the cave, don't you think? Rocks all the way up there. Oh, by the way, so the, the very first thing we did, let me give you a little retro tour here. The, vi the very first thing we did was paint the light lenses. We painted all those with, you know, just a little bit. Th this is the, <laughs> the one difference. <laughs> no, no. The main difference between us and Disney <laughs> is we have to use household standard industrial lighting. So the lighting in here is terrible. Um, if we could do, and we're going to, they're going to come back after we're done. They're going to come back and install lighting, which will make a huge difference on the whole project. But the first thing we do is paint the, the lights, and then we painted the whole ceiling. And I, how well you can even see it. So again, this is, so this is six months ago. You could see airbrush work up there all over the place. Um, painted the ceiling, and that actually made our clients nervous. <laughs> because they thought, oh no, it's kind of dark. <laughs> That's what we, <coughs> we replaced, as you can imagine, we replaced their nice white ceiling and their nice white lights with blue and dark. It's like, Ooh. they got over it once, once, once we got somewhere a little bit down the road. They said, oh, it's not too dark. So they were afraid we we're going to make it too scary for the little kids, you know. So anyway, as you can see, um, we're skipping over miles and miles and miles of painting again using rollers, sprayers, uh, and brushes. Every shortcut we could think of on the other side here. Forgive me for making you dizzy, but there's more. Again, I'm, I am darn pleased with the dimensionality of that. Like standing here, you can hardly tell. If, I, if you didn't know, if I didn't go up here, I think, and do this, you wouldn't immediately discern that these are flat. And these are dimensional. And by the way, yes, kids have already climbed up all the way up here. Our biggest danger is falling down and breaking an arm and getting sued. But <laughs> I can realize, hey, Jody, I'm giving my I'm giving my friends a tour. Oh, nice. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Jody's Jody's paying me. We'll always make room for getting paid. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so this is our second big tree. This is actually the first one that we built. And uh, again, this, there's a cable going around here that we tried to disguise as a, as a vine. And it goes up to the wall and has a strong anchor, big bolt anchor there, because we know kids are going to climb that. And we think that's OK. Same thing up there. This tree, styrofoam underneath, but we took strips of canvas and saturated it in this high-tech cement called foam coat and plastered it on. So, well, first of all, we carved the styrofoam with certain texture to try to look like a tree. Let me bring you in here so you can see more up close. Carved the styrofoam. You see, like, grooves going this way, right? And then smaller grooves going this way. Then we took canvas, and this was a pain in the butt. <laughs> it stuck it on here. We do have a, one woman, uh, Frances, comes in, a cup has been here. Maybe she's done 20 hours of work, and she did a lot of that plastering canvas, which is just a, a pain. So it's a lovely texture, um, but we decided not to do the same thing in the building, in the tree, when the building of the tree down, down the hall. As it turned out, what we did down there was probably just as slow as we did here. All right, so this is, uh, <laughs> is anybody saying anything over here? Probably, huh? What are you guys chatting about? Um, hello, Adina. Oh, I said to you hi already. To, and Nancy, yep, yep, yep. Um, uh, Uncle asked why we haven't contacted local TV. We will, we, we will actually, when it's all done. We will, we'll try to do some basic promotion. Um, so as you can see, we go from one kind of rock, great big, bulbous boulders to stratified rock down here. Again, this is all made out of styrofoam. And here's a part I'm a little kind of proud of. This is a little waterfall frozen in time. Some of you, some of you, two of you, one of you, one of you is going to wonder how that's made. So um, this is eighth inch. Oh, man, that's not dry, Jody. Huh, my mistake. 
So I need to come back with another layer. I noticed this. Yeah. Was, yeah, it was still wet. So yeah. So I need to come back with another layer of uh, epoxy resin and try to get the recipe more perfect and apply it on top of that. that that'll work. Anyway, so that that's uh, resin. And let me, let me, I don't know if I, you guys can see that there's a fish down there. I think you can see that, right? It looks like a jungle fish to me. And um, this is eighth inch. Are we still pointing the right way? Not quite. Hang on. This is um, eighth inch plexiglass melted over camp, a propane camp stove and bent, wearing gloves and bend it and then glue it in there. One of the last things we had to figure out was how to make the foam at the bottom of the waterfall. And what that is, is little tiny clear plastic beads from Hobby Lobby uh, glued, mixed up with epoxy and stuck in place. So that's our waterfall. I'm kind of proud of that little solution. This was actually the very first wall that we painted, so nearly six months ago. After we painted the, the, the lights and the ceiling, this was, this, we decided, Luke and I decided to um, um, start at this end of the hallway and learn our mistakes and stuff down here, and that's actually what we did. But it still stands, beautiful marsh or pond out there in the jungle and like I said the waterfall coming down these trees uh, of course some of them are 3d um, all kinds of fun and more branches up here all right here's some fun elements we're almost at the end of the hallway this is the the shed <laughs> the, the intrepid explorer shed top secret enter at your own risk that'll make any 10 year old kid want to go in there oh and here's a here's a cute little detail I don't know if you notice or not so there's I was talking about earlier about the illusion of the path continuing, and I was painting this wall, and I was stood back, and there's a, I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is a thermostat. <laughs> and so I painted it to look like a house on the water. Cute, huh? <laughs> and we've painted a whole bunch of doors around here. Here's where the, here's where the magical jungle ends, right there. Same thing on the ceiling. And uh, here's just a wall full of foliage. Whew. To say that we painted a lot and painted fast and painted hard is crazy understatement. Again, rollers, sponges, airbrush, anything we can throw at it. And let me see if this is, yeah. And so there's the sanctuary of the church, the auditorium of the church. And they gave us permission, of course, to paint the doors. So that's the jungle. Let me see. Oh, I didn't. See, I didn't show you this side very much, just for fun. So here's a great big mountain. Looks kind of a little bit volcanic, lost in the mist, coming down more, uh, more water and waterfalls, coming all the way down to there. And that, to me, I think, is a river. So a river hidden in the jungle, the valley of the jungle. Also, there are things like there are butterflies and life-size ladybugs and caterpillars and bees and a bunch of flowers. My assistant, Luke, did almost all the flowers. He did a great job. That was, And these are authentic, by the way. This is a Amazon, Amazonian jungle. And ironically, my, my assistant, Luke, spent the last 15 years of his life in um, South America, in the Amazon, part of the Amazon jungle. So he's been our, our on-site. Besides Google, we've used him. So going from the jungle, I just have a little bit more to show you then. Oh, now our, now our lava is blinking, <laughs> which is not the plan at all. Um, back to the jungle. Again, gold veins, there's gold in the Mar rocks. All right, and this is the last area that we've worked on that I haven't showed, in, showed you anything yet. This is uh, a ship wharf. Um, so let me see, I think I'll just sit you there for a minute. So I had fun uh, painting 
these old ships. I've actually found, I'm trying to remember the artist's name now. Uh, oh, I can't remember. Inkvist, I-N-Q-V-I-S-T, Inkvist or Lund, anyway, the Danish painter, <coughs> late, late 19th, early 20th century, and that's where I got those ships from. He was a fantastic painter. Uh, uh, just for fun, I should point out. So in the corner, th so first of all, there's going to be three-dimensional stuff. Because we're behind schedule, we decided to just go through all five, six sections and just paint, because painting is fast, relatively, and 3D is slow. So there's little, very little 3D here other than, okay, so there's going to be stacks of crates and barrels. I think I just have one or two here at the moment. Um, but I should point out that this is a bathroom <laughs> in disguise, cleverly disguised in a stack of crates. And then uh, we'll go around the corner and um, this is the next building over. There'll be a TV screen right between that and the door and the window are not finished yet. They'll be painted. The window will have mullions in it and so on and so forth. And then inside that room is going to be under sea, like a uh, um, coral reef, you know. And in there is going to be a classic airplane hangar. I'm thinking kind of like Howard Hughes era, classic, you know, airplane. Oh, just one more thing. Here's a funny, um, we, we have a, a seascape. Oh, down there is more big rocks, and this is all going to be rocks, and climbing rocks, and a slide. And this will all be very 3D, but that'll come later. But we had the challenge of what to do, you know, with these doors <laughs> that go in. <laughs> so we kind of did this sort of bizarre, trippy, dimensional thing, right? Because the shed ought to be coming this way, <laughs> but it doesn't. It goes in. <laughs> it goes right into the ocean. So this is this is 3D right here, an old tin roof up there, as you can see, painted the doors again. So that was the solution we came up with there. Again, there's, there'll be. Like here's a, a podium where they check in. We painted that to look like old wood, and it, it goes over here. Um, again, over here in the uh, the corner, there will be cranes, like shipping, you know, dock, old docking, dock cranes, um, three dimensional, coming out across the ceiling with hooks hanging down and chains hanging down. There'll be pylons here, you know, green, treated stuff. All of this stuff, by the way, we have to think about, like this pylon right here, probably will be Velcroed to the floor and it'll probably be made out of foam so that you can knock it down. So if there's, the fire marshal is very, very, very fussy, of course, as you can imagine, rightly so. Um, so, for instance, this is, this wood right here, this is just paint, but this is wood. And this has been soaked repeatedly in fire retardant stuff, uh, everything. The canvas that we are going to use in the other room is uh, just just the couple days ago. It was it was soaked, saturated in fire retardant, everything. This the this is uh, right here is fire retardant material, as is this, everything. Anyway, so not only is he fussy about what catches on fire, but like in our hallway, he's fussy. We could only come up from the walls so far, you know, we had uh, literally inches. We had how many inches, and we we took it right to the limit in the in the jungle hallway. We could we can't those rocks couldn't come out one more inch, or we'd be in violation. <laughs> so it's all kinds of crazy things we have to do. All right, so that's the tour so far. Let's go back to the Serengeti, and uh, if it's okay with you, I guess I'll paint some. Well, if it's not okay with you, you just leave. <laughs> <Which> <laughs> <laughs> I speak as though I had you captive, which clearly we don't. I don't. I'm going to close this door, and uh, I'm going to take a minute to plug in some of these devices so that they won't all run out of gas as I continue to broadcast. Is that okay? Hang on, hang on. <laughs> I have to figure out oh, the camera. That's the thing that's going to run out of gas first. So I think it's plugged in. Hmm, I didn't hear a little beep. 
Oh, this end's not plugged in. <laughs> that would explain a lot. Bear with me just a minute. Okay, now let's see if a little indicating. Yes, all right, charging up. Let me raise you guys a little bit higher. So once again, I'm back in the Serengeti room. And um, we have pretty all the big trees. Again, for those of you who maybe missed it, um, that's the Mount Kilimanjaro and these acacia trees. There's a dead, not dead, but skinny, almost dead acacia tree. They're the, this classic umbrella shape, right? And, and as you can imagine, I, we looked at, uh, I have about eight or 10 images, photographs of uh, the Serengeti and you know, just uh, of acacia trees in my phone. And I looked at them repeatedly as I painted this, uh, these trees. All right, so I'm ready to paint some more. And some of you might get a kick out of this. Um, hello, Susan. Hello, Steph. Hello, Il, Il Gil Baines. <laughs> oh, we are having too much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And a plaque, yeah. All right, so I'm going to paint. I'll, I'll show you just before I, before I pick you up. Just, just again, some of the process. Um, these are glued to a board, little containers of blue row. There's browns and there's greens. All these, I would say, all these little tricks we've learned little by little over the months. And again, I, most of this is acrylic, but it, uh, I don't know, it's got a generous, a generous mixture of household latex. We go, we go to, um, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, and go to the on sale table, the stuff that, you know, people, customers mixed up or ordered, and something got mixed up and the customer didn't like it, right? That, that cheap paint, that's, that's our favorite, right? So we've done a lot of that. I've also discovered, just by the way, if anybody wants a tip, that Hobby Lobby has um, pretty inexpensive, and the quality is really just fine, high, high uh, pigment content. This is Hobby Lobby stuff, curate and color, curate and color acrylic paint. Um, so once I discovered that, uh, we've been buying a lot of our acrylics from there. And what I'm doing here is, is I, we decided, or I decided, I guess, but I ran it by Luke. My, I want one more acacia tree peeking, peeking out over the top of this, of this tent. Okay, this is gonna be partly painted. And by the way, we decided, we, we did a bunch of research about Serengeti safari tents. And, um, in reality, their tents are, well, the modern ones are all over the map, as you can imagine, high-tech modern tents, but the classic old ones, they were all just plain beige tan brown like this. But this is a children's Sunday school room, so plain beige is, is not the ticket. Um, we're gonna make all of our tents stripe it. So we're gonna do stripes with, with a roller like this, and then, oh, here, let me show you. This is, the, this is the kind of roller I was talking about a little while ago when I was talking about making leaves. Here, I'll do one just for fun. Just real quick, let me see. I just, so, those, these are not gonna stay, by the way. But do you see what I mean? Isn't that crazy? Perfect leaf shape, one touch. So we did millions of those in the jungle hallway. No, I don't want that here, so. I have become a big fan. So here's one of the things we learned in the course of, I mean, I already knew this kind of, but it's just really gotten reinforced um, in the course of doing big painting, big, fast, hurry up, you know, behind schedule, over budget kind of project. Um, we, in a way, we avoid using brushes as much as possible when it comes to painting, because that's the slowest way to paint, is with brushes. 
Rollers are about maybe five times faster, what you just saw me do there, roughly five times faster. That's just, and that's not a scientific number, as you know, I'm just quit calling. But five times faster than brushes, and guess what? Airbrush, or more specifically, a Wagner Power Painter, which is like a airbrush on steroids, is about five times faster than a roller. So we have used almost worn out a couple of Wagner Power Painters and, and airbrushes. We had, I don't mean we've worn them out, we've used them like crazy. And uh, now this, and I've been, this whole time while we're painting, um, anytime Luke and I are working together, he's a 39, 40-year-old young man, wants to be a full-time artist. He's working at it very hard. And it's been my privilege and challenge to try to apprentice him and teach him without being the, I don't know what you call it, the pain in the neck, you know, expert old guy who's always correcting him. It's real sensitive about that, you know, because he'll do something and then I'm sure he's always wondering, oh, you know, what's, what's Dan going to say? Is it good enough kind of thing? Um, so I've t I take that responsibility very seriously, of course, and I take the responsibility to not discourage him. I take that very seriously as well, as you can imagine. So because of that, I've, I've given a lot of very intense thought in recent months to what makes, now, what makes painting good. Now in this case, of course, the kind of painting I'm doing this in the, on the, this mural is slightly different than my normal oil painting technique, right? I call my, what I do on canvases, if you, if you follow me much, you've heard me, I call it abstract realism, <coughs> right? Where the, the abstract elements are more important, are paramount over the, the image, the picture. Uh, but in this, on this project, it's, that's not so. This is essentially realism, <laughs> realism writ large, <laughs> Realism painted, painted big. So this is not, not quite my normal, now I, it's been great fun, I love it, don't get me wrong, it's been great, great fun. But it's not my normal painting because again, in my normal painting, I'm more concerned about the abstract elements is the real issue and the picture, or picture as I often mispronounce it just to be ornery, uh, the picture is secondary. Uh, but in this, in this mural, the picture is primary and the abstract elements are secondary. Although, as I've scratched my chin a lot trying to explain to Luke what is good mural painting even, I do find that the, you know, the abstract, the, 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 the energetic brush strokes are still critical. So. I've given a lot of thought to, like in this case, what makes, um, how do you do, in this case, like foliage? How do you do convincing foliage? And, and again, fast, we, don't, we have not got all day. <laughs> um, the worst of this job has been absolutely just m more fun than anything, it's just been outrageously fun. The only thing that has diminished that <laughs> outrageousness is that we're behind schedule. A little bit over budget and considerably behind schedule. So we've got that uh, sort of Damocles hanging over us all the time. It's like, oh man, we gotta hurry up. Oh man, we gotta hurry up. Oh man, we gotta hurry up. So again, that's why we've, we've pulled back our strategy. We finished the hallway which is half the job. Um, we finished that all at once, but uh, as we've moved down to these other sections, we're gonna be focusing on just painting, two-dimensional painting, 
because it's so much faster. It's the 3D, the 3D stuff, building those rocks, building the bridge, the pond, the waterfall, the trees, the trees, the trees, the trees, all that, the branches, all that 3D stuff is what really, really takes time. So we're just doing painting. So anyway, what I'm demonstrating, modeling for you here is I'm in big, in large strokes, <laughs> literally, is how to paint trees, how to paint foliage. And what I'm doing here is a pretty good example of that. Um, there's a lot I could say about that. Um, one, start with big brushes. If the light is behind you, in other words, the sun is hitting, in this case, the sun is hitting from the, the upper left, um, then you, you start out with a dark layer. And you saw that I did that with a roller. And then I used, then I, the next thing I did was a medium green with three and four inch brushes and then a lighter green with two and three inch brushes. And um, I'm making my way from down, from uh, big brushes to smaller and smaller brushes. Now, I'm, I'm gonna go back now to the darkest, the original color that I did. And of course, it's, all of this is much, much faster. Oh man, I've become a huge, and I'm, of course, I'm forcing, trying to force Luke to uh, paint with two hands. And he says he's a good sport. He's left-handed. And usually left-handers have been forced in their childhood to do stuff with the right hand anyway. So more left-handers are more ambidextrous than right. But anyway, um, so now I did my original dark layer, which was the first layer, with a roller, right? which meant that I was not, was, I was not rendering any realistic leaf shapes. So now I'm coming back and along the edge of, right, there's no point doing anything here, right? Because it doesn't show up, that's dark. Same color, color on color, dark on dark, right? So no effect. So obviously I'm only doing this around the edges and down sun, sun's up there, shady side, on the shady side now. So this is one of the principles for rendering trees in any painting whatsoever. Start with great big brushes. Again, unless you're gonna do like Bob Timberlake, look him up, who paints every stinking life, every stinking tree, every, sorry, every st <laughs> he must not want me to say this because it's not coming. Every stinking leaf, you know, absolute tongue painted it's it's I would not recommend that first of all it drives most people literally insane <laughs> so don't paint that way plus you can never get you can if you paint that way you're so slow you can't sell any paintings all right so that's the the realistic leaves see how much more real that looks now all along here on the dark side I'm going to clean these same brushes real quick And remember, everything I've done on this tree up to this point was with a roller, five inch, four inch brush, three inch brush, that's all. Until now, when I've got a one and a half and a, a real artist brush. This is a house brush and an artist brush. And um, I am now painting literal specific leaf shapes on top of the roller four inch, three inch brush stuff, okay? So the, the, it only matters, you only have to render, if I can use that word, or draw, you only have to realistically draw, so to speak, a relatively few leaves for the eye to interpret all the, this is classic by the, what I'm saying right now is not Dan Nelsonism, as you know, this is classic, you know, classic painting, <laughs> Rembrandt painting. You don't have to paint every leaf. That doesn't sound like Rembrandt at all, but anyway, 
you just paint a few, and the viewer, their brain, their mind, turns all the other abstract smudges into leaves. You don't have to paint every leaf. Let the viewer do that. Does that, make, does that make sense? Let the viewer's mind, and they will actually experience more pleasure if their brain turns it into uh, leaves than if you render it. All right, so I'm done. No, not, I'm, I'm done with the, the light green, the dark green, and the light green. I have one more very important step, and again, in, in, in the course of our this is the biggest painting I've ever done in my life. And I've, I've done some whoppers before now. Before now, the biggest painting I ever did was 120 feet long and 15 feet high. Think about that. <laughs> Maybe it was 100 feet. Anyway, 120 by 15, that was the biggest painting I'd ever done. And then I've done several, you know, by degrees smaller than that. But this, the hallway out there is 140 feet long, 10 feet high. So that's 1,400 feet per wall. That's 2,800 feet plus the ceiling, plus the floor, plus three-dimensional stuff. So it, that's just monstrously huge. So um, just having being forced to paint so big, I, in a way, forces you to think clearly because you, you don't have time to waste. You know, you, you, we have not got all day, like I said. So um, the, I'm going to finish this paint, this tree, in just a minute. And as you can see, it's not going to take very long. I, you know, we have not got all day. Uh, but here's the principle. This is, and this, I've already, I already knew this, but this has just become <laughs> cemented and amplified in my mind. And that is, especially with foliage. Let me turn you around to some of the trees I've already done here just to show you. So can you tell what's the last step? I did on that tree, the last stage, the last phase. Some of you guys know. What's the last phase, stage, step I did on that tree? If you said sky holes, you're right. They shouldn't be called sky holes, as we've talked about that all the time. They should be called tree holes, but be that as it may. Yes, it's exactly correct. So to, use, to put it another way, it's not just, this does not just apply to trees. It, it applies to a lot of things. That is that the last stage, the last phase, I'll, sh I'll, in I'll stop here and show you some other places in this very room where that is, we've done that. The last phase should be negative painting. Now, bear with me. The term negative painting, I use it to refer to two different things because other people do too, and it's a little bit confusing. So negative painting can refer to like taking a rag and removing paint from your canvas or your whatever you're painting on, right? That's negative painting. It is. But this kind of negative painting means, so I should come up with different terminology, shouldn't I? This means painting the object, the tree, oh, I'm right in your way, let me move you guys. Painting the tree by painting what is not tree. So negative painting, I'm painting the negative space, okay? And the point that I, I want you to get, especially if you're an aspiring artist, is that the whole, the whole thing, the tree, in this case, now it, this applies to more than just trees, but it, I'll just say in this case, the tree doesn't really happen, doesn't really pop, doesn't really, doesn't make you go, oh, you know, doesn't do that until you have done the negative painting. It is the negative painting that makes it pop, sizzle, cook, talk to you, makes it fun, that makes it visual, okay? It's crazy. You can tell, I, I'm, I'm like a, I don't know what the word is, like I'm, a, like I'm a new convert, even though I've known this principle for years. Uh, having worked on this mural for six months has just, has made this principle so much more uh, important, central, key to me. Um, that it's, it, it, what makes it work is the negative painting. So we did this out in the hallway, we did it in the grass, we did it in the bushes, we did it, you do, do it in the clouds, any, any highly complex shape. It's crazy, it's the negative painting that makes it, makes it really cook. Makes it, makes you go, oh. you know, that thing that you want people to do when they look at your painting, oh. they're surprised, right, by the, 
beauty of it. The, and people are impressed by, I've said this many times, unless, unless they have a master's in fine arts, which means they've been completely corrupted. <laughs> All ordinary human beings get a kick, absolutely get a kick out of seeing something accurately rendered by a fellow human being. Um, so I'm just about done here. I'm going now to a, a and we're, we'll talk just a minute here about um, sky holes. Again, they should be called tree holes because it isn't always the sky that's behind your tree. It could be a building, could be a hill, could be another tree, could be all kinds of things. But today, this literally is a sky hole. Shouldn't be called that though. Should be called a tree hole. So. Let's talk about tree holes for a minute. And I, again, I'm really, this is fresh in my mind because just, just yesterday, Luke was here. By the way, the part of the reason I can broadcast today is because I'm here all by myself. I don't feel free. It's a little bit awkward for me to broadcast. I mean, he's a nice guy and he understands, but you know, I, I just want to, I don't, uh, when he's here, I feel like I need to give him my mentorship and attention and not be broadcasting. So anyway, that's why I can do it today. Um, and this is fresh on my mind because I was talking about it with him just yesterday. All right, I might be finished. I can probably call that finished. Oh, one more touch. One more important little detail. It's not sky holes, but, and then I'll come back and talk about sky holes in a minute. Because all of y'all, if you're an artist, if you're a painter, it, all of y'all have heard about sky holes. And then it sounded easy to you. <laughs> Let me jump inside your head. And then you went home, so to speak, and tried it. And it's like, Wah. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> or here's what actually happens with a lot of early journey painters. They do what the teacher said. So they are assuming it actually is working when in fact, it's very much not working. <laughs> it's like, I hate to break the news to you that the, those sky holes look like crap. Okay, most of you though, you readily admit, yeah, I tried it and it didn't work. All right, so let me try to give a little more. I've done some of this before. By the way, that's bits of sun hitting the stems, the branches of the tree that's... So I can probably stop there. I don't know if I'll come back and do any more, but I might not, probably won't. So I would like to say that's a tree, top of a tree. And it's pretty fast, right? You saw me do it. All right, sky holes. Here's the deal. And this, this happens a lot, 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 lot in all kinds of painting. How to put this? You can't, you can't just say, oh, sky holes, blue paint, dots on the tree. What you'll end up, end up with is a dotified tree. And you're going to wonder, why doesn't this look good? <laughs> so I'm trying to, let's try to answer that real quick and turn you guys a little bit. Um, two things. One is where to put the green dots. <laughs> Sorry, where to put the blue dots. By the way, stay away from dots. Try to make them smudges of various size and shape. And you have to visualize in your mind and usually the painting talks to you at this point. You don't force your iron will on it. It talks to you and says, sky hole here, sky hole here. And the reason it says that is because, okay, so you can see, for instance, that this mass looks like it's coming toward us. And this is underneath this mass. And this, these lines, it's a kind of a row of blue dots, <laughs> blue sky holes. So we get this, and there's branches showing in there. All of that's on purpose. While you're doing sky holes, you need to draw the tree. You can't just put random squirrely, whirly blue dots on your tree and expect it to look like. It. No, you're drawing the tree by drawing not tree, or in this case, by drawing sky. You are rendering, you are rendering and drawing a tree. So you have to see in your mind's eye, before you put the blue dot down, you have to see where the branches are so that you paint around them. You can't just slap it up there and expect it to look like something. Next, as long as you say, of course, and you know that the color of the sky holes needs to be the same color as the sky that's around the tree, right? So that's why I had to mix up some 
There's a white cloud here, so I made up, mixed up some white. Not quite believable, but might be close enough. I might come back and touch it up. I don't know which. Um, so you already know that. It has to match. Now, here's, the, here's a big question. That I've, I've done this before, so I'll do it quickly. Here's a classic question. Are sky holes soft brush, soft edges or hard? How to paint, Alex, for 40. Um, the real answer is both, but hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. OK, the, the, the art professor answer is sky holes are hard and soft. All of these, by the way, are hard. And they're probably going to stay that way simply because of the size of the painting. But that's so, you know, if that's true with this big, it would be a different story. Um, so the classic, the correct answer, which is wrong, the correct answer which is wrong, is both hard and soft. Now, here's why it's wrong. If you're an early journey painter, if you're struggling with sky holes, listen to me, this some of somebody out there, if you're struggling with sky holes, forget that stupid art professor answer. It is wrong. If you're struggling with sky holes, here's one of the things you need to learn how to do. The answer to the question, I'll tell you what, I'm going to keep painting over here. There's a little, I just realized there's a little bit on this this tree. I just just did the dark layer yesterday, right before I left for the end of the, at the end of the day. So I'll paint while I'm talking. Okay. So if you're if you're struggling with sky holes, then the answer to that question is quite quite different. If you're struggling with that, it, 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 if you if your sky holes look great and look like you know sky coming through the tree then yes, the answer is hard and soft. But if you're an early journey painter, that probably doesn't describe you, does it? Nope, it doesn't. So for you, the answer, hard or soft, the answer is hard, 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 hard edged, hard edged. I don't, and I, I know this is crazy, but I've seen, I've judged, you know, in various events and art festivals and so on and so forth, Thousands of paintings, thousands of paintings, most of which are landscapes, most of which have trees in them. And if if the person is not just a crackerjack expert at trees, then their sky they've tried sky holes, and their sky holes are butt ugly smudges. So uh, until you really can visualize and accomplish and achieve. Uh, believable sky holes. And for you, this and this applies to every early journey painter. Your sky holes need to be hard edged. Once you've mastered them, then you can begin introducing soft, smudgy edges. Now, the reason for that is because almost every student painter, forgive me for using that term, every student painting I've ever seen where the student tried to do sky holes, again, they were just ugly, half-ass smudges of blue paint. Ugly as a day old, never mind. Just ugly, OK? So I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> um, <laughs> pay attention to what I say. Till, till you've mastered it, till you, till you go, oh, oh this, I got it now, then you can begin introducing uh, soft edges, all right? Until then, if you want to get make good fast progress, nope. The answer to, to that question is: Are are the ed, are the? In other words, let me say it another way. Most students don't load up nearly enough paint, blue paint, on their brushes to do sky holes. They have just a little tiny smudgy, pfft, horrible. I don't know what to say about it. They, they're just tiny little, and they, and they make these just horrendously ugly little smudges. All right, so have I vented enough on you there? You got, I'm, I'm anxious that you get the point. <laughs> I really want you to get good at painting, and I want you to get good at painting uh, sky holes. So the answer is hard edge, hard edge, hard edge, hard edge. Load up your paintbrush with thick blue paint and slap it down, baby. That's what most beginners don't do. They don't have the courage to slap it down. So that's why their sky holes look horrible. 
Uh, there's other things that they do too, but that's the main one, okay? Like if it doesn't match the color of the background. <laughs> I'm assuming you already know got that part. I don't have to tell you that, right? All right, let me, let me get off that rant. <laughs> Let's do a different rant now. <laughs> No, I, don't, I have no idea what rant should come next, but I, um, I'm going to practice what I preach. So theoretically, that, that tree is all done, all except for the what? Yeah, sky holes. Now, they're going to be the sky holes, so to speak, quote unquote, on this tree are going to be quite a bit different um, than the, the ones I just did on the other tree. Why? Just put the tree so much further away. That's all. It's just it's a faraway tree. So. Everything's smaller, so the sky holes are much smaller. I'm bringing my tray of blue paints. I have four different colors of blue here. And let me move you guys a little bit, because I know I'm probably blocking your view quite a bit. Whoops. Oh, no. I just discovered that my 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 uh, extension cord was had landed in a buck the bucket of rinse water. So, <laughs> welcome to my world. Welcome to the life of an artist. Um, I don't know if it's if it shorted out or not. A fuse didn't blow. But anyway, I'm not going to plug it in, which might might mean my batteries my how many minutes I have to broadcast is limited. All right, so really, I'm just cleaning up at the moment. It's not even sky holes. I'm just cleaning, cleaning up some of the errant, that's a good word, isn't it? Some of the errant strokes that I made when I, when I slapped down the that light color, that, I'm sorry, that dark, dark, dark color of green at the very beginning of this this tree. So now a little bit of, like I said, a little bit of sky holes, pretty, pretty discreet. Don't need a lot. By the way, um, I'm so used to doing this, I don't even think about talking about it anymore. Um, I paint with two hands and two brushes, and I am constantly mixing colors on my, on my brushes. I'm kind of assuming you see me doing that. It just dawned on me, though, that if, if you are only painting with one brush, then you're, you're, you don't have quite as much control. So see that one through here? I'm mixing two different colors of blue. I've been doing that for 20 years, so it's it's just habit, great habit, by the way. That is to say, it works very it works well for me. You should give it a try. All right, I think I might use this to trim up some of these some of these branches in this trunk here. Negative rendering an object. Listen to this, and I, I said it before this way, always be looking for any excuse at all to render an object in the negative. You, that's, a, that's a Dan Nelsonism. Always be looking for any excuse at all to render an object in the negative. That means you, you paint the object by painting what's behind it. So that applies to anything, not just trees. But tree holes are the classic example of this. But just a minute ago, I was painting the, uh, the trunk, the branches, rendering them more carefully. Uh, one of the places where I use this trick extensively in my own painting is uh, when I'm painting um, crowds of people. So fairly abstract people in my paintings, you know, they might be this tall to four or five inches, depending on the size of the painting. Um, Um, th that's where I use that tech, that trick again extensively. Okay, hang in just a second. I want to talk about some of the, some negative painting down here, but first I have to rinse out these brushes. You know, don't you? Acrylic paints. 
and of course latex paints just as bad are death to brushes so contrary to what you guys think who th are afraid of oils because you think acrylics are easier cleanup you're exactly backwards it is acrylic paints that destroy brushes 10 times faster than oil paints and so the, the, what I was going to say is I would never if I had my wits about me take this nice $30 brush or this $30 brush <laughs> to and leave it sitting in the water like some of you guys do five minutes in the water and that brush is ruined so you just don't do that um the the water swells the wood absorbs water swells and the ferrule this metal thing called a fair rule ferrule um ex expands straight that's why your brushes get all wiggly on the end because you soak them in the water I, I say that all the time and yet i i teach art classes and and i glance up and half the students two-thirds of the students in the room um have their brushes sitting in a in their bottle or jug of water i either scream nicely i do have manners when i teach or i roll my eyes inwardly suck it up and say I already told them so many times if they want to ruin their brushes. Fortunately, most of them are using cheap old brushes, so it doesn't really matter. All right. Um, <laughs> let me see. I'm going to pick you guys up off the stand here for a minute and because I want to show you something. That, back to this principle of whenever possible, paint stuff in the negative. So this row of, the, the, like the furthest row of trees, this is the Serengeti you know, state park, whatever, semi-arid. This row of trees didn't look all that great uh, earlier this week when I was painting. It wasn't until I busted out the negative painting that they started to cook and sizzle. Let me pick this, this area right here. So this was a smudgy, ill-formed, poorly rendered tree. It was basically, it was everything you could see there. But when I came, when I mixed up, and by the way, the, this pale violet, uh, periwinkle blue, purple color was, was, a, was a happy accident discovery. It's like, I thought I saw a hint of purple there, so when I went, oh, that'd be good. And then, then I ended up bringing up, up into the mountain here, and I don't know if you can see, but that was just, oh my goodness, that was just beautiful. But this tree, all these trees began working, be became beautiful, frankly, became beautiful after I did the negative painting. Then the purple fades out and it turns into a real a warm spring green here, uh, and then turns into a more aqua bluish green here. The whole thing, so that's just for fun, by the way. And that's a, that's a classic Disney, by the way, that the background color fades from, from a teal to a spring green to a lavender and then back over there two more colors way over there but the point i want to make is this this stuff these trees didn't look good till i negative painted them cool huh and you can see it everywhere i mean it's just now it pops and it's pretty anyway so i think i'm going to end this broadcast right there i've been rambling on for plenty long enough <laughs> way too long somebody says <laughs> that's as is my want People come to my, watch my videos because they like long videos. <laughs> All right, let's see what you guys, see if you said anything I have to talk about. Hello, Il Gil Bates, there's so much, yes. Thank you. It has been work, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Uncle S, did we do preliminary drawings? Uh, in the jungle, I did a very, like, you know, these rocks here, those rocks here, big tree here, very, 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 almost stick man kind of. Um, I did quite a detailed sketch for the fish, for the uh, shipping wharf out there. I did a very detailed, uh, that's quite a detailed, small, but very detailed drawing for that. In here, nope, nope, uh, just winging it pretty much. Things like, and as you, as you can imagine, just in case anybody's wondering, so this, this, like for instance, and the last thing we're gonna do in here, of course, is gonna be the animals. But this safari truck, I mean, how did I get that? On my phone, <laughs> I look up safari trucks, you know, or Serengeti 
they showed up in a lot of our Serengeti photographs anyway, you know, and I flipped through a bunch of them and said, yeah, that one. And, and I, I know you guys, you know that, but you know, sometimes I find, sometimes early journey painters are more inclined to fly, fly by the seat of their pants without any photo reference, which is like, I'm a good drawer, if I can say that. I'm a good at rendering. I've been doing it my whole life. I don't do it, you know? I mean, I, I, looked, at, I looked at acacia trees probably 40 times while I was painting these trees. Keep going back and back and back. And this I just flat copied. I mean, I didn't project it or anything. I just drew it. But right. So the next thing in this room is going to be uh, the animals, which Luke and I have been talking about. That's just going to be the the icing on the cake. Um, oh well, actually, we're not the the very lower lowest tier. That this is that's all needs to be done. Over here, we have part of a bush needs to be finished, and so on. So th that needs to be done, and then the animals. Um, but the, as I said, the animals are essentially the, the icing on the cake. That'll be so much fun. And frankly, that's the only thing the kids will care, <laughs> will care about, which is fine with me. Um, you know, the best kind of cartoons on t movies, you know, are the ones that the kids like and the parents like them too, right? And that's, that's the way I'm operating here. Um, I want the kids, little two, three, four year olds come in and be blown away by the giraffe and an elephant and a lion and the monkeys, and, right? But I want the parents to come and go, damn. <laughs> this is a church. You don't say damn in church. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I hope they do say, damn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'll paint just a little bit, a little bit more highlight on this trunk right here. Um, what was I talking about? Anything important? <laughs> Beach. Yeah. So uh, yeah, sure. A little bit philosophical. A little bit. Since I am working in a church, you could probably Im imagine that the, the church's main motivation is. And by the way, this is called Living Word Family Church. And they really, they're very serious about the family in their name. They really, you know, every church that knows what they're doing, you know, has a, has a target audience. And these people do. And it is largely family. So that's, and also I've discovered this church is really given to big projects. This is not the only big project. They, they make movies. They, they do big festival events and stuff like that. And I after I discovered that, it's like, oh, I get it. And that kind of puts what I'm doing in perspective. If these, and I love it. These people are given to big projects. That's wonderful. And of course, they're, they're, it's very, from their point of view, I would say it's very, my artwork is very utilitarian. That kid, family comes to church one time, or the kid gets brought by friends to this church, and they go, the kid is like, whoa, whoa. They love the jungle, you know, they, whatever. They love the shipping wharf. They love the, oh, one, one of the rooms is going to be like inside of Star Trek, Star, Star Wars spaceships and with big views of galaxies far, far away. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so that's, I didn't mention that one earlier. And underwater and airplane hangar. So all this stuff. So the kids will be, oh, mom, oh, mom, you can't believe, I want to go back to that church, right? That, that's understandable. That's, that's in a sense, why they seem to do that. Of course, the church believes that there, any family, any kids that come to this church, it'll improve their life. I agree with them, all things being equal. Um, but between you and me, um, I affirm that value. I have a lot, not higher one, I have a lot more abstract one, frankly. I mean, since I'm in a church, I'm going to use a little more churchy language, OK? Um, if, if that offends you, then bye-bye, <laughs> hang up. <laughs> Most of you guys know me, so you're not at all. But uh, especially the jungle. Uh, no, 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 I say that because that part's done, but every room. I want, frankly, I want people to walk in here and cry. <laughs> I want people to go, <laughs> and this is happening over people in the finished parts. They walk in, their jaw drops, their eyes fill with tears, and they go, and they don't even know why. 
That's, that's as an artist, and I'm talking to you artists here, getting a little bit, woo, uh, 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 trans-dimensional. <laughs> uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It'll come to me. Anyway, getting a little, a little bit tran transcendent Here we go. and trans-dimensional. Um, I want people to experience through their eyeballs the presence and the glory and the beauty of God. That they, and they don't have to have that language. You don't have to have that language. And, and it's almost like I don't even want them to say, oh, I'm experiencing the presence of God. That would make it kind of religious and folk, hokey and phony. No, nope, I just wanted to walk in and they don't even know. And it's not because, this, it's, it's very interesting. And this is, uh, this is different from my normal paintings for, if for no other reason than it's just so dang huge. You, the ceiling in here is painted, by the way. <laughs> We're not going to paint the floor in here, but the ceiling is painted, clouds, blue sky clouds. So it's a real submersive or immersive experience. When you walk in here, it's like, whoa! <laughs> you know, how much more when we start doing some three-dimensional stuff? And uh, people are just blown away. Not because, by the way, just to be a little bit uh, less uh, metaphysical, not because it's a picture of Mount Kilimanjaro. That's part of it, but that the, a, a photograph of, of Mount Kilimanjaro enlarged and printed on vinyl and stuck to this wall would have an impact. It would. There would be like, whoa, whoa, that's cool. But there's something, there is something metaphysical, weird, transcendent happening when it's a painting done by human hand. And I believe if what, what all this does is it suddenly goes beyond rationalistic thought, analytical, left-brained thinking. And it comes does an end run around people's thinky brain and slaps them upside the head with their intuitive, creative, God-given, like, whoa. And it is the fact that a human being painted it. Now, it's not because they're so dang, they are impressed. Of course, they'll be impressed, but no, 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 no. This is not impressed. It's not that simple or that shallow. It's almost every person to walk in here has one head and two hands. And they, they know, like there's few except there are exceptions to that. <laughs> not the head part, but the hands part. But when they walk in here, they'll know a human being, this, so they'll know that a human being with one head brain, mind, and two hands, just like them painted this. And there's a sense of identification, like intimacy. It, it, it's obvious that an animal just like me made these marks. You know, so it's, it's kind of like they can picture, now they don't know I paint with two hands, but they can picture replicating what I did. They don't, they don't even have to know that's what they're doing. That is what they're doing when they don't even know it. That's why a vinyl photograph is not the same as a painting. So anyway, when they experience intimate identification with a, an animal of their kind, me, and they're amazed by the skill, they're amazed by the rendering, like, dang, that looks real. That really looks like a road going off into the Serengeti. Dang, that looks like a Jeep. Wow, that looks like Mount Kilimanjaro with mountains in front of it. Wow, that looks like Mount Kilimanjaro with snow on top and blue sky. Oh man, look at that cloud. You know the feeling. And my point is, I believe that in, in those precognitive feelings, God is hiding in the bushes. <laughs> the real God who made us, because he made me, made you, in my opinion, you know, if you don't like it, that's all right. Uh, I'm happy with my opinions, by the way. Very, very happy. Not religious, happy big difference. Huge <laughs> religious is antithesis of happiness, by the way. But anyway, um, that, that, that's part of what's happening. So I'm very excited that when people walk into this church, and we've already talked about it, and they don't plan to take this down, you know, in 15 years. Um, this should be here 100 years from now, and we are a moldering in our graves. <laughs> There's a work of my hands through a gift that God gave me with his hands. Um, we'll still be having people have an encounter with the transcendent, with with beauty, with God, and so on and so forth. So even though the church is using it largely as a marketing tool, and that's okay with me, I don't mind. They also, by the way, they're not so shallow that they don't understand 
what I'm saying. They, they affirm, they would affirm heartily what I'm saying. But that's, that's my goal, is that not that I've created a good commercial for this church, even though it's fine with me if I have, hope I have, but um, the fact that, uh, and we've seen it happen over and over again, that, that people walk in, especially the jungle that's finished, and the jaws drop open and tears come to their eyes, and they don't even know why. That's, that's cool. That's way cool. All right, I pontificated and sound like I'm preaching, doesn't it? This is about as close as I've ever got to preaching, so if you're new, oh, that wasn't too much. All right, let's see what you guys are saying now. <laughs> um, let me pick up my iPad. We are having way too much fun. That is so true. <laughs> Thanks, Il Gil Bates. I don't know who you are. There's a you have a girl's picture. Is that are you are you a girl, Il Gil Bates? It's a funny, funny, humorous name. Anyway, bless you. Um <laughs> Now, artist Stefan, oh, Stefan Bauman, bird holes. <laughs> I do know Stefan. He's a J Joe Cool kind of guy. I envy his coolness, but I ain't him, so I don't really envy it too much. But he's, he's an amazing guy, and he calls him bird holes. <laughs> when in church, call them church holes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uncle, come on, come on, come back. Um. <laughs> yeah, there, I, there was a hot, there was a politician behind this tree down here, but the tree he's the tree covered him up. <laughs> oh, there, there's so many things. Oh, hello, Jim Foxhole Willie. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh my goodness, Jim's talking to me by the way about a painting, wedding painting that I shipped to him last week and. So glad to hear it. Um, I have to check it in the mail <laughs> well, tomorrow anyway. Thanks, Jim. And uh, I was glad to report that when Jim got the painting, he, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, Jim said, oh my goodness, this is Foxhole Willie, said, um, once again, we discover that what we see on YouTube doesn't hold a candle. Is that fair enough? To the real thing. The real painting is way better in real life, right? It, right? I appreciate that, Jim. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so I don't know if anybody out there is a Far Side fan. I was a huge. I was so disappointed when he quit. But you know, I just think it'd be fun to have a, a rack of ribs. You know, maybe some some legs sticking straight up, and a bunch of buzzards standing around a carcass. <laughs> There's all kinds of things. It'd be so much fun in here. But now nah, the two, three, four year olds, now, they would think it was funny probably, but their teachers would be greatly alarmed. <laughs> you see a 40 year old man in counseling <laughs> you know 40 years old. Yeah, it all happened when I went to church and there was a picture of a dead zebra on the church wall <laughs> yes in a hundred years I will absolutely come back as an art critic <laughs> without the woo woo I'm just coming back anyway. All right, thanks guys. I'm glad I finally was able to get you guys up here and introduce this thing to you. I'll bring you back again because we're going to be here for several more months. And uh, I'll bring you back for an update. Oh, it's outer space, underwater, airplane hangar. Haven't even started those three sections yet. And of course, we'll finish all this other stuff. In the meantime, I've got a whole another room just this size right there, right around that that Sarah Getty to. That I'd, I have to serengetify. <laughs> if you serengeti. <laughs> All right, let's stop this before it gets any worse. Love you guys. Great.